welcome people. Now let's continue with the next set of games uh, because it seems like people are pretty clear. Okay, let's go for 1300. And again, let's go E5. Beginners can play the Sicilian, although, well, I'll talk more about that afterward. And he played the King's Gambit. I know a lot of people are anxious to see how I play against the King's Gambit. Now, there, there's a couple of very interesting options um, against the King's Gambit that I can recommend to beginners. But right now, I want to play a variation that illustrates uh, the sort of the, the point of the King's Gambit and various ways we, we have of playing against. Now, the best thing I like to do against the King's Gambit that I would recommend to beginners is to take the pawn and then play d5. Uh, what is the purpose of the move d5? The purpose of the move d5 is very simple. By playing f4, white has weakened his king side, right? I mean, everybody would agree with me on that. And by our principle, when our opponent weakens his king side, we want to generally open up the center in order to be more, uh, in order to be able to exploit that. But we don't want to take this pawn immediately with our queen, because as we know, we allow the move knight c3, uh, which kicks the queen and increases white's lead in development. So we're going to play knight f6 here and try to take that pawn with our knight, which has two effects. First of all, we keep our queen safe. Second of all, we actually lend support to that f4 pawn by taking with the knight. So he plays d4. That is a very typical mistake. Knight takes d5, and he cannot take the pawn with his bishop. Now, he continues to develop his pieces naturally. That makes sense. But we're going to do the same thing, right? We're just going to play bishop e7, uh, which some people might consider to be a passive move. But remember, we are a pawn up. Right? I don't need to develop in a particularly active manner. Uh, you might be looking at this and saying, whoa, 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 wait a second. He could have taken on d5 and then taken on f4. Couldn't he have won the pawn back? What the hell are you doing, Daniel? Well, I will explain that after the game. In fact, this is in the same theme as the last game. We are transforming our advantage. I am willing to sacrifice back the pawn. That is why the King's Gambit is not as effective as people used to think, because black can essentially sack the pawn back in many lines and gain in return uh, a set of positional advantages. Now, uh, a question for you guys. How do we take the sting out of this bishop on c4? It's annoying the hell out of me. I don't like the fact that it's x-raying my knight. I don't like the fact that there's pressure on f7. What, what's a good way to just prevent that from happening? No, definitely not knight e3. That helps him. Knight e3 helps him, right? It, it actually helps him reinforce the pressure. So we're going to go bishop e6. Uh, typical development move, taking the sting out of his bishop uh, and uh, asking him what he wants to do. No, he can absolutely win the pawn back, right? He can take our knight and then he can take a pawn. But what are we going to have in return for that pawn? Well, we're going to have first and foremost the two bishops in Bilal. Whatever, we'll talk about that after the game. Thank you once happens. Now, um, the time has come for us to contest his control over the center. Uh, and there's several ways for us to do that. Can somebody suggest for me a couple of interesting uh, moves? There's many things that we could do here, really many. Now, c5 uh, is my initial inclination, but I actually have stopped liking it, and I promise to explain why that is after the game, but basically he has c4 in return. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to play knight c6. This is a very, this is a five-head move, okay? Because what I know some people are thinking is, what, why are you... <laughs> Why are you making this move? Why are you ruining your own pawn structure? Like, what are you doing? Uh, and I will explain this. That's the purpose of the speed run, okay? But basically, we are going to use these C-pawns as a bargaining chip, right? Now the C-pawns look bad, but in reality, they're not bad at all. They can actually be pushed forward one after the other, and they can be used to contest White's control over the center, okay? Uh, I know that that's a bit of a vague explanation, uh, but... I will delve more deeply into this after the game. We are a little bit short of time. Okay, so we see c5. Now, here's the thing. If he takes our pawn on c5, that first pawn is going to be re replaced by another one. And now watch what happens. Watch very, very carefully what I do. I take the bishop. Now, I will take the pawn on d4 with my queen. And once he takes my queen and I take with the pawn, I have magically corrected my pawn structure. And that pawn on c7, remember what I said? The fact that the pawns are doubled can be a good thing because eventually we might get a situation where I've undoubled the pawns and I have another pawn on the C file that can be used to support its neighbor on D4. I've got an extra pawn. We are in an end game. Uh, I know some people wanted me to get end games, so here we go. What do we do in end games like these? First and foremost, we need to activate our pieces. We need to make our pieces 
the best that they can be. So where should this bishop go in order to be the best that it can be? Yes, indeed. Now, the second thing that we need to make sure of is that his pieces do not get to active squares. This is the part people forget. This knight on f3, where does it want to go? Where does it want to go? What active square does it want to reach? And how do we stop it from reaching that active square? That's all the prophylaxis. Yeah, f6, that's all prophylaxis is, and you guys can find it. We go f6, and we stop his knight from centralizing on e5. In fact, Robert Hess, uh, my partner in crime, he, pay he sort of draws attention to this all the time. The fact that we have a pawn that is essentially two open squares away from the knight. That is a very good situation for the pawn. Okay, we're going to drive our opponent crazy. He wants to go to f5. That is very clear from his last move. Can we prevent him from coming to f5 with either the knight or the bishop? I will explain everything after the game. Absolutely we can. Let's drive him insane. We go g6, right? And this kind of boa constrictor play is what people hate to see, right? And, and this is what people don't do enough of. They get they get fixated on their own ideas, and they don't stop to ask themselves what their opponent's idea is. When you do that, uh, you often play moves like g6, and he's out of ideas. Let's continue in the same style. He wants to push this pawn and expand on the queen side. Can we stop him from doing that too? Even though it's not necessary, can we just play in the same spirit? Yeah, a5. Okay, you see GMs playing these moves all the time. Now, this bishop on e6, ladies and gentlemen, it's not doing the most that it can do. Can we put that bishop on a slightly better square? Let's do it. Can we put that bishop on a slightly better square, folks? We absolutely can. Let's centralize it on d5. Now, one thing that I want to do here is push this pawn to f4 in order to support this bishop on e3. And essentially, the stage of the... Okay, again, remember, he wants to get his knight to e5. Can we prevent that? Can we now stop him once again from getting his knight to e5 while also improving one of our pieces? I mean, you can see that I'm playing very gradually. I'm not doing anything crazy. I am slowly, marginally improving my position to the maximum. I'm pushing all my pawns up to good squares to support the pieces. And I am limiting the mobility of his pieces, stopping them from getting to active squares. Um, and eventually, how am I going to win? I'm eventually going to start doing something a little bit more active. One idea is to put this bishop on e4, try to take on d3 and take on b3. There's a lot of ideas that I could employ here to win the game. Because I'm low on time, I'm... Well, uh, I'm going to play a little bit quickly here. But there's one more thing that I want to do because it's an endgame. What is the sort of textbook piece of advice that is often shared in the endgame? What is the textbook piece of advice that's often shared in the endgame? What do you kind of always have to do? You have to bring your king up. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to play lip service to that. Even though in a real game, I wouldn't have gone king g7. I'm going to show you guys that I care uh, about endgame principles. And I'm going to get my king maybe to f6. Maybe to just to g7, so it you know, so it just stays ready for future action. Uh, now let's get this rook up to a nice little square on e4. Uh, potentially, I'm eyeing the maneuver rook f4, rook f2. But why did I play rook c8? I have 38 seconds. One more move I want people to find. Okay, so rook c1 was a blunder. But can somebody answer me that question? Why did I play rook c8? What was I preparing to do? Yes, I was preparing to break with c4, and I'm actually still going to have a chance to do that. Why am I breaking with c4? Well, because my pieces are more active than his, uh, according to our principle that we've formulated many times. When your pieces are this much more active than your opponent's pieces, at some point you're going to have to open the position up. And the more you open it up strategically, the more the domination of your pieces can be displayed. Okay? So everything I did hopefully makes sense here. I didn't do a single move that was mysterious. Everything was just simple, improving my pieces or uh, making my opponent's pieces worse. Either, uh, both of these are the two sides of the same coin. And, and that's how you play on games light. All right, so we're just going to take this guy and we're going to try to trade the rooks and promote this pawn, force him to give up his knight. Boom. Now, there's many ways of winning this position, uh, but in the spirit of uh, preventing our opponent from doing any shenanigans, uh, what would we do? We want to prevent every single shenanigan here. And he's got only one source of shenanigans, that's the deep pawn. What would we have done? Rook b1 is correct, right? Now, I know that my style is crazy, and I like sacrifices, but it's important to know how to play like this too, right? In order to develop a sacrificial style, you also have to practice essentially identifying and preventing your opponent's ideas, the boa constrictor style that Petrosian the Karpov is, is known for. Okay, one moment, please. Well, Unholy Soda, hopefully that answers the question a little bit. Let us continue with another game.
And you guys can see that our opponents are are better now, right? They're not they're not folding over and dying easily. But that doesn't mean you know that we have to despair. We just have to apply our principles to a greater extent. Once again, some the guy plays h6. I don't get this move at all. So we're going to repeat what we did in the previous game. And uh, already at this point, uh, I you know I, I said before that, that that we have to accumulate our advantage slowly. But the move bishop g4 specifically is a mistake. And the reason it is a mistake is, as we have discussed many times, it leaves these two pawns both undefended, and that can be exploited with what very typical move? Yep, Jason, I remember your request, and so I'm not going to say I deliberately did that, but I had that in mind. Queen b3 is correct, and uh, he is in huge trouble right out of the opening. And, and this is why I recommend people to study the opening, because I didn't do anything crazy here, but I, at my opponent's level, he should know... He should know this stuff. I mean, he shouldn't get into this kind of trouble in seven moves in one of the most conventional openings. Not not to, like, give him crap or anything. But uh, if you want to learn from his mistakes, then, um, you know, this can be very easily avoided if you just learn the basic theory of openings. Now, uh, my opponent is actually playing this quite well, right? He takes on F3 and he takes on D4. Thank you, Nicola, for the thousand bits. Uh, but I saw this, right? He is winning the pawn back. Uh, if I take on d4, then he will take with the knight, and uh, his knight will be very active. So what should we do in order to limit the activity of his knight? How do we use our pieces in order to limit the, the mobility and the activity of his knight? Bishop d5 is the right idea, but not the best execution. There is a very similar way of doing that, right? Bishop b5 to pin his knight uh, and essentially immobilize it. And rook b6 here would be a very strong move. Let's see if he finds it, and then we will drop our queen to a4 in order to reinforce our pressure on the diagonal. No, these guys are good. I mean, uh, again, I don't mean to suggest that these players aren't good. They are. I'm actually very impressed at the level displayed by some of these uh, some of these players. And now we're just going to take on d4. We are up upon. We are in great shape, uh, and his position is essentially in ruins. Uh, so let's see what he ends up doing here. Black has ways that he can try to fight, and he does find one of them. He plays d5. Well, he, he he sort of he 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 tries to open the position up. And, and this speaks to something that I shared earlier, which is that in such situations, the best way to react is sometimes to do nothing but to sort of passively develop, right? And, and I know that you guys, and I see that you guys want to play knight c3, which I love, right? You just develop. It's okay. The blind knight, thank you for the tier one. And in a situation like this, we just continue developing. How do we continue developing with an eye toward supporting the pawn on d4 i don't want this pawn uh to get to get weak let's go bishop e3 bingo okay let's castle long in order to tuck our king and he's probably going to castle short and now well we have a situation of opposite side castling what does that mean that means we need to start attacking and we're going to do that with the very typical move h4 i am playing with fire here i'm just not expecting him to well first of all i think that we're playing well um this is not necessarily, and I repeat, I'm not playing exactly how I would actually play in a real game against the GM because I'm also trying to emphasize certain important themes and the application of certain principles. Uh, I'm not trying to dumb it down for anyone, right? That's not what I'm doing. But what I am doing is I'm trying to steer the game in certain directions that may be more conducive to people's learning uh, than if I were to strictly play in the way that I would play against the GM. Okay, now the time has come for us to uh, take care of a couple of things, right? Well, actually, no, the time hasn't come for that yet. Let's continue attacking. What do we do? How do we continue attacking? He has unpinned himself by playing queen e6. We should keep that in mind. He's unpinned his knight, but I don't really see where that knight is going to go. So let's go h5. Now, e5 is the move that most people are suggesting, and I was going to propose that move initially. But when you push your pawn in the center, you always have to ask yourself what the drawbacks of that move are. And had we played e5, notice that we would have weakened that f5 square, and his knight could have occupied that square and exerted pressure on both the bishop and the d5. He's got rook to a8. That is a very slow move. It allows us to open up the h file. Clearly, he wants to prepare a6, but what he's not sensing is the time, right? He's not sensing the fact that we are so close to just checkmating him. Thank you, big sweaty father. Uh, for the sub to uh, Ice Cream Overlord, he sets a vicious trap. If we take on h6, we actually lose a rook. Does anybody see how? If bishop takes h6, he takes. We take on h6. 
loose pieces drop off when you castle long, you have to pay special attention to that position of the king on c1, he has queen f4. So let's first play e5 in order to force this queen onto a compromise square. And only then are we going to take on h6. That was a pretty vicious trap. I don't know if he said it consciously or not, but in any case, that was pretty impressive. Uh, but that's why we have to doubt everything, right? We always have to double check. We have to make sure that we're not stopping the calculation prematurely and that we're actually checking at every juncture for our opponent's uh, ideas, right? And so th that just has to be sort of an automatic process. Okay, now, uh, crucial question to ask yourself in this position, is he actually threatening to capture on b5? Is that a threat? Is that a threat? That is actually not a threat because a8 is gonna be hanging. But, uh, and, and follow me carefully here, even though it's not a threat, uh, we have to be aware that he might move his rook away. And uh, after he moves his rook away, not only is AB going to become a threat, uh, but in addition to that, uh, if our bishop moves away, he's going to take on B2. So what I propose, folks, is that we take care of this bishop immediately so that we can untie our hands, we can wipe our hands clean of this. And what does that allow us to do? That allows us then to repurpose our queen from a defensive piece in a piece that is mired in that in, in just crap on the queen side to a piece that actually helps in the attack. Now, when I say helps in the attack, what do I mean? Where does the queen belong? If you could point to any square on the board here, where does the queen belong? And how do we get it there? It definitely belongs, well, ultimately, where does it belong? Oh, everybody's saying the correct move. But what I'm asking people, exactly. So h6 or h7, one of those squares on the h file is where the queen belongs. He's probably going to go rook b8. This guy is playing probably like a 16, 1700. And we are going to play one move b3 here to take care of the b file pressure. Then we are going to probably continue our plan with queen d2, queen h6. The other idea here, the other way of executing this very same plan of putting something on the h file. Can somebody tell me what I'm talking about here? Let's say that we did not want to move our queen. We wanted to keep our queen on c2 in order to protect uh, some of these squares. What else could we have done? We can, uh, exactly, we can double up the rooks. Now, before we even double up the rooks, I'm looking at this knight on c3 and I'm saying there is a very, very, very juicy outpost for this knight. This outpost will guarantee that he doesn't have any shenanigans down that c file. Uh, could we get that knight over to that outpost? Exactly, we get that knight over to the outpost c5. How did I find this move? Well, I asked myself, what does he want? And I recognize that he probably wants to play c6. And I don't like pins like this, right? I don't like my queen and my king both to be pinned by like a measly rook. So by improving the position of the knight, I'm able now to resort to revert back to my original plan. And I'm actually just going to keep my queen on c2. So it just guards and supervises that knight on c5, lends some extra protection to it. And I'm going to I'm going to delegate the task of checkmating him to my rooks, at least initially. Uh, he goes a5. So he's he's trying to execute an attack of his own. But as you guys can see, my attack is both faster and stronger. Uh, and it's going to lead to checkmate a lot faster. Uh, again, these games are, are very competitive. I mean, these players are good. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not doing anything crazy. I'm just sort of playing typical attacking moves. I'm improving my pieces and I'm winning the game. Okay. So let's see what he does. I'm going to catch my breath. Well... That's the point of the speedrun, though. I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that it's easy, uh, but what I am trying to suggest is that most moves, m most people can make these types of moves on a regular basis. And while chess mastery is uh, a very difficult process, uh, this 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 tendency to by by some people to claim that it's some sort of magic uh, in the direct sense of the word is wrong. Uh, there is logic that goes behind every one of these moves. And I'm trying to at least partially, uh, you know, expose that logic and, and show what it looks like. Uh, if only to, you know, inspire some of you to, to, to pursue this kind of mastery. Okay, so he resigns. Uh, yeah. Uh, so in, whoa, Polar Bear BC, five gifted keeps me going. And that's what keeps me going. I appreciate it, Polar Bear. Uh, thank you for the gifted sub to Dogator, uh, to Shigeir, to Jusko, and Craig, and Nighting, Samurai Cocaine. Um, 
All right. Um, so let me see. We have over 2,000 subs, which is awesome. And the support has been unreal. Whew. Well, thank you, guys. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, this is definitely, uh, you know, demanding of energy, but uh, it's the best kind of demanding. And uh, to have people who appreciate me is, is honestly uh, amazing. So uh, it, let's get a first the, look at the first game here with the King's Gambit. Now, there's many ways to play against the King's Gambit, and if you guys watch that old lesson I gave to Tori, there is even the move C6 here, which I uh, once showed to John Davis. Uh, it is a very interesting and very rare move. It actually prepares D5. It's kind of like a Karo Khan within a King's Gambit, right? You guys have seen the Karo Khan. Uh, so this is kind of like the Karo Khan in the King's Gambit. Uh, you prepare the pawn break D5. So it's a very interesting line. Uh, but in this game, I decided to play very simply, right? I open up the center, I get the knight over to, to d5, and I earlier mentioned, uh, well, I would recommend 100 Endgames You Must Know. Uh, that is one good book on Grandmaster, on, on, on theoretical endgames. Now, this is the moment that I wanted to focus focus on, because a lot of people would look at this and say, Daniel, aren't you giving up your pawn? You're, you had an extra pawn, you're giving it up, why are you doing it? Uh, and, and this, again, allows me to reinforce the concept of transforming your advantage. It is true that our opponent sacrificed the pawn on move two, but that creates for us a bargaining chip. We can use this pawn and we can give it away strategically in return for other advantages, such as the fact that he no longer has an attack against our king. We have the two bishops, which is a tangible advantage. And we, well, it's not even compensation. It implies that you're down material. We're not down material. Material is equal. Uh, so here we can go c6, just defending that pawn and staking a claim in the center. We've got the two bishops. We have a very comfortable position. I, I wouldn't say that black is better necessarily, but black is certainly very, very comfortable here because of the two bishops, uh, solid position and good development. Okay, so that is another thing you have to make sure you understand about gambits. You can take that pawn with the intention of ultimately giving it away in return for other advantages. All right. So in the game, he ended up not accepting that pawn for a very long period of time. And when he finally did take it, he allowed me to take on d4 with my queen and essentially force a trade of queens. Now, somebody asked, I think Abdul Rahman asked, why did he have to take the queen? Why can't he just slide his king over and basically force me to retain my crappy pawn structure? Well, can somebody answer that question? for me? What exactly is the reason behind... Yes, queen takes b2. I mean, simply you take the pawn and you're up another pawn. Now, black doesn't win a rook, but uh, this is a very problematic. I can even return to d4. Uh, so this is all very straightforward stuff. C takes d4, rook b8. And at this point, I just started that endgame campaign. I get my bishop to the best where I can go to. Now this boa constrictor style, asking myself what my opponent wants and preventing it. F6, g6, literally just stopping this knight from getting to any of these active squares. It drives my opponent crazy, right? A5, stopping him from expanding. And eventually, right, look at that. I'm just sending every single piece away. Rook E8 again, stopping at E5. And now C5 to cement the pawn on D4. And finally, I'm preparing the decisive pawn break, C4. That's, some people ask, like, how do I actually, how do I actually, you know, win the game when I do this? Well, you have to start looking for pawn breaks or you have to start looking for ways to actually start attacking your opponent's king. Uh, but here I, I decided that a pawn break would be most fitting uh, because of how stretched out his resources are. But he made the task quite easy for me by just giving up a rook, or rather an exchange. And now the pawn break was even more effective because I have two rooks to one. I trade rooks and he resigned. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, that's how that game went. And again, here he, he essentially killed his chances for the whole game by playing h6. I mean, I just don't understand that move at all because it doesn't even really prevent anything. Uh, so it allows me to occupy the center now that move queen b3, and he's already in trouble, right? He's already in big trouble uh, because f7 is hanging and b7 is hanging. And honestly, uh, in this position, I, I remember that I actually missed a much stronger move. I can actually play a preliminary tactic and only then take on b7. Can anybody actually spot this tactic? I missed this in the game. And this is actually theory. I remember this now. It's actually not d5. Well, d5 uh, is a bit counterproductive because the knight moves away. You plug the diagonal. It's bishop takes f7. Good job. 
Queen takes f7, and the idea is that the knight is now undefended. White is simultaneously attacking two pieces, and white is going to end up up two pawns at the very least. So that would have been even stronger than what I did, but what I did was good. I mean, I have huge pressure on his position. I win a pawn, and we get this opposite side castle link situation, which often means that you have to immediately start attacking your opponent's king because time is going to be very limited, and that's exactly what we do. We attack our opponent's king by opening up the h-file. We avoid the move bishop takes h6 because that would have blundered the rook. We first play e5, then we take the pawn. We don't take the pawn to win a pawn. We take the pawn to open up that h-file. We clear, clarify the tension, get the knight to an outpost, double the rooks, and deliver checkmate on h7. Yeah, I mean, not blundering this kind of stuff takes practice, right? It takes that sort of metal detector, if you will, in your brain that that can only be built up through years of, of training and of blundering things, right? Okay, guys. So that was, I think, enough speedrunning for this evening. I'm feeling pretty drained uh, because these games were actually pretty, uh, pretty rich. You know, they were full of life.